Natasha. Hello, Gregory. How are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good under the circumstances. Yeah, where, where are you? Where are you calling from? Nobody knows. Yeah, undisclosed no location? I wish, but in these times, is anything undisclosed? <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, I see Laurel. Hello, Laurel. That's my friend. Yes. Uh, look how many faces. I know. If that, we, you could put it on a different uh, speaker view if you, if you like. Or, I, I like it. This, okay. Great. This is really futuristic. Dystopian times, and I guess this is the, the hope side. Yeah. Fascinating. Wow. So, um, as I mentioned to you, I'm going to ask you a series of very open questions and you can answer them as you wish. Terrific. So and as I said to you, I, I have no idea what I'm in for. I hardly know where I am or what's happening. But that's, that's how I, I like to proceed. That's the perfect context for this, I think. So the first question is, what is your most vivid memory from childhood? Ah, geez. Well, I definitely remember, you know, I have this like idyllic two year period. So uh, I'm, I'm born in New York and, um, you know, then there was a tax evasion situation that my parents were engaged in in the 80s, of course, Gregory. And this led to uh, an escape to Israel. Now, this was not a Zionistic excursion. It was tax evasion. And I do remember that those, I remember that the years prior, so I lived there from the ages of eight to 10. And so I was this displaced, um, as, you know, New York kid who was now in a foreign place, but I remember it as this idyllic period of like uh, the last time there was like a happy family home of, it's the only thing that I can really think of as a childhood in a way. Like there was, because uh, uh, it was like, you know, I had these uh, two parents, nut jobs though they were, and I had a, a brother and we had dogs and we had, you know, uh, a yard. I had a BMX bike. And like, I also, I think I had very pure dreams because I'd been already a child actor in New York. So I'd already done like Pee Wee's Playhouse around six years old and things like that but I almost remember it as like my first work vacation also. Like, and I started dreaming of other things. I think when I got there, uh, I think I had a fantasy of becoming like, you know, Golda Meir when I grew up. I was like, oh, that's what I'll do now that I've landed here. So I remember that that was kind of like my, it sort of, it was changing. You know, the, the first movie I ever did, I was an extra, uh, Mike Nichols at Heartburn, Nora Ephron, and, <laughs> Uh, that's a dog. I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, Jack Nicholson and, and Meryl Streep. So I think in my mind, I was like, oh, am I trying to be Jack Nicholson when I was like six? But by the time I was eight, I was like, no, I should be Golda Meir. And then divorce hit me and my mom back in the city, single mom, scholarship kid. And then I was like, oh, I see. I'm just kind of like a workhorse. That dream is dead. You know, now I got to make it in showbiz and make a living for these people. Um, so that, and suddenly it was just, you know, terrible private school, rich kids, everything that started to be bad in Manhattan. So I remember that as like the sort of, the, the, the best, like just like a BMX bike. I had a Rottweiler named Heidi who mm -hmm. would like, you know, chase me as I would like ride my BMX bike to the Greek aqueducts in Caesarea where we lived. And I would like go swimming. And I remember her, uh, like I was swimming out in the ocean and, uh, she came and she like bit me in her Rottweiler mouth by by my like bathing suit to pull me back to shore because she thought I was drowning. And I can like, I can feel the sort of like sun and the like, Heidi, I'm fine. I'm fine, Heidi, you know, and BMXing back home. So who were some of your early influences when you were coming of age? Jeez, I don't know. I mean, the ones that are, you know, by the time I'm a teenager, they're like, vivid they're coming at you fast and they're sort of obvious like you know fast and fellini and uh you, they're kind of all uh you know the usual suspects 
Um, I guess when I'm really little, I, I remember being into um, like Carol Burnett and Tracy Ullman. I remember liking them. And during this period in, um, when I was living in Israel, so this is like 88 to 90, uh, I think they'd left, uh, you know, my father was a boxing promoter, uh, but like very, very low level. He was really just a con artist, but he was, he had gone there with this dream of becoming the Don King of Israel. And he was going to bring Mike Tyson to the Tel Aviv Hilton. And so uh, the, the movies that we had, you know, of course, I spoke English, not Hebrew, uh, though I learned uh, enough. Um, but the movies that we had in the house, therefore, were these very macho movies, which is why I kind of have this sort of, you know, tough guy sort of pseudo exterior that is uh, unintentional. Um, because during that time, I would really just watch these few VHS tapes that were, you know, Scarface, Rocky, The Godfather, and oddly, A Fish Called Wanda, Francis, with Jessica Lange, getting a lobotomy, and uh, then this movie called uh, It's Alive. It's Alive, yes. Which is a creature in a baby carriage. But so I would watch those over and over. Wow. Is is your work autobiog autobiographical in any sense, do you think? I would say, you know, almost entirely. But, um, and yeah, and I think that I'm also so uh, deeply untrained at every level. You know, I, um, um, I'll just tell you guys about my college uh, education. I uh, was, um, I was in uh, early admission to Tisch to be a, a double major at film and philosophy. It's not Yale, I know. And uh, it was the only school I applied to. And then it was expensive, so I dropped out. And I went to the film forum instead. So I'm basically, you know, uh, there was some sort of a deal I had arranged where I was gonna get my senior year credits at my freshman year at Tisch. Uncompleted, so I'm basically a high school dropout. And um, so as a result, I think everything is, is self-taught and therefore, whether intentionally or not, self-referential in, in some way. Um, I, I do think that it was almost, there was kind of this fork in the road and, you know, obviously also I have this, you know, a whole uh, drug period, which kind of like eats, you know, don't do drugs, why it steals 10 years of your life. Uh, but in, in that decade that I kind of lost, I guess there was also this sort of like horrific, exist, you know, existential gain. It was kind of this negotiation where uh, in the loss of those kind of, you know, years of, you know, like my ingenue years, I kind of got out of there with like a real deep sense of what it's like to be in the abyss and come back out again. And, you know, like, what is Viktor Frankl talking about? You know what I mean? Like I had sort of, um, and plus I had, of course, all that LSD experience before all that, which was also helpful, those two things kind of collided. So self-referential to the extent that it's, you know, through a, a sort of specific filter that probably allows for a, a wider lens than I realized. Uh, I think by that, I would, I would say that it, um, it means that my world was probably not as small. You know, I would say my, my advice, I guess, would be to uh, omit the drug part, but do try to get, um, a sort of wide swath of life experience, meaning as a result, I'd sort of seen a lot of high and low of the, the scales of, of life, meaning, you know, I'd spent time in, uh, you know, the tombs in Manhattan, you know, like being rested and stuff. And uh, I'd spent time sort of, you know, going to movie premieres and sort of everything in between. So I'd had um, my, my Rolodex of reference was pretty, you know, large of like, you know, from the tents of downtown Los Angeles to kind of, you know, a high point of sort of like, you know, ego and sort of like, you know, swirling drinks and paparazzi. So I think that was all sort of helpful as uh, I emerged against my will into adulthood. What is the least favorite part of the artistic process for you? The part you like least? You know, self-doubt and being up all night and sort of in like a state of self-flagellating horror. Uh, you know, I have this negative self-talking, self-criticizing mind that's out to get me, just all hours. And 
it is a fucking beast. And, you know, despite everything, it's like, I am someone who has a good deal of evidence to support that, in fact, uh, you know, I am not an imposter, that uh, there's a body of work now and years and kind of like an artistic community that would suggest that there's something along the right path that I'm on, you know, for me. And yet, uh, still, it's like, you know, the fucking waking terror of, is it good enough? You know, am I a fraud? Am I a hack? You know, in sort of like writing season two of my show, which is now sort of in the ether of Jodorowsky's Dune because of COVID-19, um, it's kind of, you know, it, it just every choice and every, I mean, there's, there's nothing really, writing and editing are uh, two-handed horror uh, because of there's, you know, this, this finality to it. You know, I think acting also just because it's in my bones and, and similarly directing, like acting, directing, producing, they're all a little bit more, you know, improvisational and um, it kind of you can get some, I can steal some of your buoyancy or yeah, we got to move on to the next scene. There's no time to kind of deal with yesterday's horrors because moving on and it feels sort of like it'll be somebody else's problem to fix down the line if it sucked, you know? Um, and it's kind of like, it's also, it's just in my bones. Like I've been doing it since I'm six years old. I've been sort of on sets or in that, uh, you know, dialogue of how we make things on a set. The sort of like quiet time of hunkering down like pen to paper and like making those decisions that are conceivably just wrong and bad and won't make sense, blow up the rules, break the puzzle box, whatever, or locking picture is like, it's just harrowing. I don't want to shit on anyone. Uh, really <laughs> What's the part you like best? It's a great question. <laughs> I really stumped you now, I think. Yeah, I mean, like there are these moments where it's, you know, there are these moments where it really feels like you're flying, you know? Like, and I would say they're, they're different for each category. Like very obvious, you know, in in theater, if you're like acting, I'm, I remember one time, um, you know, acting in a, in a play, I was playing um, uh, Ethan Hawke's sister uh, and it was the last show and, straight up like you know forgot my lines in the last performance and like we looked at each other and there was like such mischief in both our faces because it was kind of you know the last show and it was like oh this is really crazy this has not happened before <laughs> like where are we and <laughs> what happens now and there's like a surrealism that sort of like is suddenly in the ether and you're kind of holding this like ball of ether and you're passing it back and forth with your eyes and just waiting for and in that moment you're like very much like fully alive and in terror and then you sink back in and you're like I'm so there was actually a moment there the way that happened is I forgot I was even in the play you know what I mean like I was actually fully embodying somebody else and so it's almost like a, oh my god you know and of course that's followed by you know nightmares and you beat yourself up whatever but it's like that's very out or you know when you're directing and you're at the monitor, oh my, that's so much fun. I think that's definitely my favorite thing out of all of this stuff thus far is, you know, at the monitor directing something, especially like, you know, someone like um, Danielle Brooks on Orange is the New Black, who's just like so ridiculously gifted. It's just, it's, it's insane. Like, you know, everything, she, so you're, I'm just like riveted to the monitor. And so I'm being like, hey, we got it, we got it. or um, when I was uh, directing my like very eccentric uh, Kenzo short film with uh, Maya Rudolph and just like watching her and then uh, Chung Kun Chung, who's one of like the most incredible cinematographers in the world was the cinematographer and um, Ariane Phillips was the costume designer and Kabuki who's this legendary makeup artist. I'm like watching that come to life with like choreography. I was like, damn, this really fucking, <laughs> you're like at the monitor, it's all fucking neon, there's dancers, it's Fosse. I don't know what the fuck is happening or, like how, how it was that that actually went from my brain onto the screen, especially because that had no studio system, no, you know, it was like Umberto and Carol from opening ceremony Kenzo and Maya and Greta and Fred and Macaulay Culkin and my friend Morris. It was like very homegrown 
kind of like literally just, you know, my, my brain kind of on screen and so much fun because also the stakes are low of, I guess it's really just like a fashion film for nothing, you know? Um, so th that's very fun. Being at the monitor is a joy. Not so when self-directing, because then you're relinquishing control. Like at the monitor, you're like, oh my God, everything's it's by inches, by hairs. Like this cramps photo is wrong because of the, the electrical outlets cannot be in the frame. Are we gonna be able to cut that? Can we put, you know, so that OCD locked in place is fucking awesome. But when you're on camera acting and directing, it's terrible because you're basically like, Gregory, was that it? So suddenly you take all that control and it's just like this codependent need for you to tell me I did okay and you're moving on concern. But writing is very different. Like writing, it's almost like you have these moments of like elation when the idea happens and then this like crushing failure when you realize that that dislodges something else. Mm. Who is your imagined audience? Do you think about that? When you, um, either mean, writing or um, after you finished production? Yeah, like I, I tend to think of, you know, what I find most helpful to think of, it's kind of like, you know, for, for you know, each of us as, you know, uh, artist types, it's, I think we all have this kind of dual horror happening, right? It's like we have this very pure side, which is, you know, I'm doing it for the other outcasts. Like I always think of, you know, myself as like this little weirdo who was kind of, you know, being made fun of at school and sort of like my process of discovering things like John Waters or whatever was so life affirmed. Um, it just felt like, oh, there's kind of a room. There's like a, a wide swath out there. And it, not everything is, you know, and no offense. And I'm sure you guys are all big fans, but you know, it's not just a kind of Jennifer Aniston friends universe. <laughs> and like, I, I don't even say that with any shade. I mean, she seems like, a, you know, a lovely human being and, and she's good at what she does, but it's something that was made very clear to me that I am not, you know what I mean? And, and so, to find out that there's also space for all this other kind of stuff is a huge relief. And the good side of me is always thinking about providing that to kind of like those, those outsider kids, like that, you know, subculture kind of like that needs it, you know? Um, and then I think for all of us, it's like this darker side that's like just heartbreaking, that is like very shameful which is, it's like very hard to get out of like my mind, this idea that also the artistic community at large is going to be sort of commenting on, you know? And that sort of like, they are gonna decide if I made something good or not. Like right. if it's to ridicule or to compliment and like what a dangerous game that is. Cause if I believe it when it's good, I gotta believe it when it's bad, you know? And I think that that sort of double-sided coin, it's like a two-faced beast, you know, because one is so clean and so, and it's like, it's almost like falsely altruistic, you know what I mean? Because who, which one really is in charge, you know? It's a, it's a curiosity, I think, for, for all of us, you know? Like, do I need you to tell me that it's good in order for me? Suffice to say, I've spent my morning Rewatching um, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, and it's on my mind. And you know, boy, do I love this documentary. Uh, and you know, just to say that that's sort of like the third part, right? Which is the thing that kind of gives me peace or whatever. That's almost like the the spiritual sort of side of things is this idea that also like sometimes we're just making something for like five years that never gets made. You know, and like that, that is as big of a part, like that's like sort of where I think the truth of the artistic experience is lurking, is in, you know, the experience of, you know, like Laurel and I made something together that kind of, you know, we, we never finished, but like that process of what we got to engage in together, we took a road trip, we filmed a bunch of shit, we have 
photos, we have writing about it. Like there's no planet in which that was a waste. Like I can fully am now getting to be of an age that, you know, that I can see where it all sort of clicks in, in its right place and sort of nothing is wasted in the way that I think it is at the time. What movie makes you cry? Huh. Um, I mean, I'm remembering some of like my biggest cry fests were probably like, definitely like, you know, Woman Under the Influence cried a lot. I think The Deer Hunter made me cry. Mm. Um, oh, you know, um, Beast of the Southern Wild, it really fucked me up. Um, that's what it's called, yeah? Yeah. It really like, I had major identification with that little girl. Like I felt like uh, Pemizane Wallace, yeah? Um, I felt like I had not seen sort of like my childhood experience <laughs> portrayed so well on screen of just kind of like, you know, a family of alcoholism and sort of like being lost in this kind of magical realism in her dream life to kind of escape it. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like, you know, large animals and hope and feeling like you've got to be tough no matter what. And there was like that movie really broke me in the theater. Wow. Uh, Avatar did not. I think <laughs> I saw it around the same time. How has success affected your work? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have some. Like, uh, you know, I'm definitely like that. I'm a real, you know, uh, due to the years just flying by, I'm sort of emerging as a much more of a journeyman than I think I initially anticipated. And I'm definitely somebody that's had, you know, large stretches, years, decades, where I've been very cold. You know, like, thanks to Orange is the New Black and Russian Doll, it's like I'm in the mix now and I'm keenly aware of how rare and lucky that is because I've had fucking years where I couldn't get arrested, where, you know, I just couldn't get work in any of these, you know, fields that I wanted to be engaged in. Um, and... So I would say that, you know, in a very literal way, I now, you know, get to make things. Like, it's sort of a question mark how long that lasts, sort of for anyone, let alone for a woman and let alone for an eccentric, you know? Like, you know, quite possibly I'm in my Dennis Hopper last movie phase where I, you know, blow it all up right here, right now. And, and you know, so be it. I mean, the good news is I have a working experience of like, you know, surviving kind of lean times as well. Um, so I don't feel too like, uh, you know, hooked on it. In other words, I feel very much like, um, I think for all of us, it feels like so crucial to sort of be seen as we are, you know, it's kind of like, that's in many ways why we do what we do is like this hunger that they'll just kind of they, you know, this like infamous they will like see us like, for who we are, you know, <laughs> and like through the work. And it's just, you know, on some level, I kind of feel a measure of like peace with that now. I'm kind of like, we're good. Like, do I just walk away now? Because it was so bad for so long. And now it's okay that I'm definitely somebody like launching on a sophomore album with the terror of like, is it worth it? You know, <laughs> like, or do I just stay home? Um, what have you learned through failure? Well, I mean, a dark side is, you know, just how full of shit it really is. Like, you know, like an identification with like, you know, a lot of John Lennon songs, like nobody loves you when you're down and out, you know? Uh, like there's, a, you know, I mean, just to be, you know, straight up about that, like it's, you know, it is a, like a fucked up cutthroat world out there. And like it, you know, the good news is I, you know, personally think that there is, um, there's something good about like dark nights of the soul. Like there's something inside of the heart of darkness. Like if you can sort of make it out and sort of like, you know, it also that, that downtime really gave me like firm roots because I was like forced to kind of like 
you know, rebuild a psyche and sense of self-worth on more inner stuff. Like the idea that I wasn't only shaped by outside, you know, um, ideas was very seminal for kind of like, you know, my, uh, what, I guess I'm middle-aged now. Um, you know, it really, it helps because it sort of, it says like, you don't get to fucking tell me who I am. Like that that's over. Like we tried that, didn't work out. Don't like how it feels. Thanks very much. I'm going to continue to exist over here now. And you can either get on the bus, get off the bus. I'm sure there'll be a few of these and a few, like you look down anybody's roster of kind of long distance runners and there are inevitably like there are failures there are dry spells it's they're just it just kind of happens you know so i think it kind of basically gave me a a measure of perspective that i i think it's delusional to say that you can really have that when you're just kind of like flying high all the time you know i've only been on a private jet like twice also um but just, you know, I think if that's your lifestyle, you just fucking private planes all day. I don't know that you really have much of a, uh, you know, sense of, of roots necessarily when it kind of dries up. Like, I feel like if it dried up or whatever, I'd be like, oh my God, I got all these books I wanted to read and all this shit I wanted to do and uh, all these naps I wanted to take and, you know, it kind of, you know, so this is, because it's a lot of, you know, a hollow man shit out there and it's good to be mindful of the fact that that is not uh imaginary you know it's also great great like at this point i have like a real tribe you know what i mean of kind of 20 year players in the arts who have been like like chloe 70 maya rudolph like i have known these girls since you know the 90s through thick and thin through ups and downs so like you know, those are not hollow men that when I see them in the world, those are actually like my people in the arts, not these kind of, you know, the grotesque, I don't know if you've ever seen Spirits of the Dead, the, yes. the Fellini. Yeah. That's kind of a little bit what it feels like when you're on the wrong side. What is your greatest fear? Uh, I think it's very practical and it's uh, smoking. It's like, I am just so terrified of the way in which I continue to use these things as a crutch and what the other side of that is gonna look like. Um, my, my greatest hope is uh, AI and um, sort of, you know, that they're gonna come up with these uh, sort of new organs and that I will live long enough to be given them and become half robot. Uh, once I'm half robots, I, I very much like the idea of in Futurama when they have the heads in the tanks. Yes. I think I'd be very happy there. Uh, so I'd like to be a head in a tank. I wouldn't even mind a measure of like Black Mirror, kind of like going out every now and then on some sort of, you know, a little uh, quest. And so I'm, I, my dream is to live long enough uh, have you ever read um, Welcome to the Monkey House? You know, the, the Kurt Vonnegut, and they kind of like unzip their outer bodies and they're just kind of floating around. I'd like one of those. Um, so. Uh, so maybe this, is a, maybe this is a related question. What is your favorite guilty pleasure? Uh, yeah, well, I don't even think of it as a guilty pleasure. I just think of it as a yeah. way of life. You know, cigarettes so, and water are just really what I... Function, it's terrible. I would say to young people, you know, I know it might be, uh, you know, you might see it in the, you know, the musician friends or whatever, the smoke and the cigarette, don't do it. Terrible, terrible, uh, um, outdated. Um, guilty pleasure is, uh, I guess it's like, uh, you know, um, like sort of like um, crossword puzzles, uh, like, you know, video games, like sort of stuff that I know is like screen based, that is not really like doing much for me and is just eating my time. And like, um, you know, I'm guessing that most of us are wired similarly in that when you put like something on with substance, like, you know, a movie or music, or you like actually open the book, 
you're like, oh yeah, this is what I like. This is like my thing. I'm into this and it actually makes me feel sort of more peaceful and it makes it kind of like, it, it calms me. But instead it's kind of like, you know, um, all the tech, it's like you don't even notice that kind of hours have gone by and that I feel a little bit like, you know, like dirty and unhinged. Um, and, and yet I don't stop because it's a, a guilty pleasure. My, my porn, just to bring it back to the group, um, is, uh, you know, the, the New York Times crossword puzzle. I really will get lost in it. What's on that heavy rotation for you in quarantine? Well, so now what I do is sometimes with these games, you know, the terrible mistake of getting involved with this Animal Crossing, which is very stupid. And this is a very, you know, I, no offense to anybody playing it. By anyone, I mean me. This is a very stupid thing. And, uh, and what I do to kind of uh, alleviate some of the guilt and horror and shame is, uh, you know, I'll, for example, like there's this new, um, something called like the, the rabbit hole. It's a, a, a podcast on kind of like- New York Times podcast, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll kind of like listen to that while I'm doing it. So it's kind <laughs> of like, a little bit of a karmic negotiation with myself to kind of assuage the, you know, guilt and shame. And I'll do that with any number of things. I also, you know, for research, I'm, uh, you know, real, I've fucked myself, but good with this quantum physics show because guess who's not a quantum physicist? Me. And, you know, this is something that uh, they don't even have all the answers. And yet, you know, I find myself in this situation where I need to understand, you know, uh, double slit experiments and, you know, spooky action at a distance and all of these sort of, uh, you know, concepts and uh, wormholes and parallel universes and the multiverse and, you know, I, it's, it's a lot. And uh, so I will also kind of, um, you know, listen to a lot of things about that. Like, uh, Gene wants to control my camera. I'm guessing that's a decline because you're probably- yeah, No, no, no. 0.03. De decline, um, decline it, yeah. And so I, I think I've been doing a lot of that. And then what else? Uh, what else did we do? Well, you've been busy You're in the writer. Yeah, what's the right? third band? Oh, we watched that uh, Tiger King show. Oh, yes. uh, we watched, um, I watched that new Alex Garland show. Um, oh, I watched this, uh, you know, Diane Cannon doing a Sue, Mem Sue Mengers in The Last of Sheila. Uh, and, uh, oh, I rewatched the, the King of Marvin Gardens uh, oh. during COVID. Um, also, Adam Curtis documentaries I've been really into. Are you into that? Um, and that's very cool. I feel like young people would really enjoy those. So that's my, my um, that's a great list. Um, I have one last question. And if you have time, we could take a few additional questions from, um, if you're up for that. Sure. Tech avail. Yeah, so the, for my last question is, what advice would you give students in this moment of peril? Huh. I mean, I would say to like, you know, well, this is, you know, selfish and exclusive to, to the arts. Uh, but, you know, I would say to really like, you know, use that time to kind of like get in there with that sort of like weird self, like get all the way in there because it's so rare to not have the kind of distraction of like, this was a big event for me today. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, I cut my bangs over the sink uh, to prepare. And, you know, there's, a, for me as, you know, it could be all of your grandmothers, uh, I, uh, like, I, I, I'm really having like this, you know, like fundamental memory of like myself as like my teenage self kind of like, locked in my room and sort of like just with my weird stuff and my fucking books and opening them and like my music playing and then like watching some fucking weird movie and then being over here and being over there and like really 
getting in there, like realizing that that stuff is the stuff that makes you you and that there's, you know, there is uh, no point trying to be somebody else. Like, so somebody said that, but you know, uh, somebody said, right? Like other people are taken, so you may as well be yourself. Um, Rupia. Are you ready for a few questions? Yes. So the first question is from Collier Shore, so the great artist. And Hello, Collier. She's the one that told me about the uh, situation. Uh, Hello. You're, we got, um, can we mute, unmute Can her? you hear me? There we go, there we go. Natasha, hey, how's it Hi, going? Hi, how's it going? Good. So I guess you, you didn't show up like you said you were gonna, but that's okay. Oh yes, I did. I, I yes, Kyle told me that there had been some nudity and some of the others. So I said I was going to be new, but with Kyle doesn't realize that I'm actually a never nude. So the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. It was a good effort. Yeah. So what I guess I wanted to open up was the Kenzo film that you did, um, and like talking about Fellini. And I was watching it again today, and I was thinking about all the trigger stuff and the kind of like Maya Rudolph speaking, uh, you know, an unknown like language but people understanding it and then I was thinking about the androgyny of clowns and the androgyny of you and Russian doll and so I somehow wanted to put all of that into a question about how you kind of walk through and deal with power and control and also deal with like femininity yeah I mean um it's funny that I definitely think that it, on the whole, I sort of, cause you know, often it's like my references aren't, um, there aren't a ton of women when I'm like referencing things usually, which I sort of only am, you know, beginning to discover um, as I also like will make recommendations to like, you know, my friends on what to, you know, read or watch or when I'm, um, you know, talking to the production designer or on Russian Doll or something. Like I realize that my references tend to be often male and I think that in part sort of it's because I sort of assume like the right to kind of repurpose their ideas for like a specifically like I'm sort of like I'm all the woman you need asshole <laughs> like, you know a little bit there's this kind of I want to put my sort of unapologetic like I'm like it's enough that I'm like I I like a certain um, like I just feel like boys get to play by different rules. So I sort of like to, or historically they have, so it's almost like I like to steal their, um, you know, moxie in a way. Like when I think about like Francis Ford Coppola being, you know, on the set of uh, Apocalypse Now and just being like, I need the helicopters in the shot. I need them in the shot. You know, like it's so insane when you think about it and it's the kind of thing that only like a man could get away with. Like, I don't think that they would have given, you know, Francesca Ford Coppola that same leeway. Uh, not then, not now. So I sort of, I think I like to kind of like eat up, you know, their um, unapologetic nature and, uh, you know, and I sort of across the board. Um, but in general, yeah, like I don't think I have a ton of, you know, I talked to, um, one of my friends, Clea Duvall, about this a lot, that we were kind of like, you know, in the 90s, we were sort of like, you know, these, these uh, two, we were these two women, we were best friends. And weirdly, it was like, I, I think that we were sort of a, uh, not in a time yet where people would really identify as men, you know, but I think that what Clea really and I had as such a bond is... I think that we were like two boys talking all the time about like the things we were gonna make and the things that we were gonna do. And we weren't like, like I often wonder about that sort of like now, if I was sort of coming of age now, like would I identify as a woman? I don't know. I mean, it's like seems, but that's, you know, it, it so it goes, but I think that definitely, um, well, but that's a Russian doll, I definitely like, proceed as though it's a male character with the sort of like into like the there's aspects of the woman that are so awesome but it's kind of like why not be both like you don't fucking tell me <laughs> i'll be whatever <laughs> go ahead collier sorry 
No, it's just thinking of the door in the Kenzo film, you know, the clown school door, and it says women in charge. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. You know, and you're going through that, and then you have that, like, long scene with Fred, where it's just sort of, like, you know, waiting, 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 and yeah. I'm thinking that's, like, your helicopter scene, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah. like, the longest yeah. bit, you know, in a fashion film ever. And, and that's, like, a kind of entitlement that I think you find when you go through that door. Yeah, I, I certainly, um, well, there is this kind of like real, like, I think that there is kind of this, you know, idea of, like, I've always felt very ashamed for not being a wallflower, you know, like, that's been kind of my life story, even as like a young girl, like, you know, boys would make it very clear that that was not super attractive, you know what I mean? That like, I took up a lot of space in a room. Um, and I think further like I really I I I like this like uh, yeah I just like that unapologetic sort of male energy from that easy riders raging bulls time period and I feel like what they did were just sort of like big moves like sometimes when I watch things that are um you know sort of m more contained and kind of like uh um, I like I sort of I don't like I don't want a small budget. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't want to have to like apologize for the fact that I want a real budget to make something really insane. Like, I, that, that, that's just my, I don't know that, you know, if I'll get away with it, but just that would be my preference. Um, like, I, I don't know. I don't even know how to describe it. Like, but there's this kind of idea of like, you know, that I should just be like this like soft, you know, uh, withering thing or something and like make something like a small female story that makes sense because it's kind of coming of age and she's a girl and that's I get that I more now. Mickey, next question. Mickey, are you there? Did he disappear? Just to say if anyone's into that. I think that's, you know, great. I'm gonna say it's not my stick, you know? And I think that that's okay too. How would I find that? I think he's, uh, okay, I'm gonna go to Morgan then. Morgan? Okay, I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Morgan. Good. Natasha, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you. Um, I wanna start by just thanking you for existing when I was a teenager. Um, it just meant a lot. And you touched on this a tiny bit, um, but I'm just curious, aside from media, like what are you doing right now to have fun? Um, weird term, fun. Um, Whatever that means to you right now. <laughs> a lot of, you know, I've been going neighbor's house to neighbor's house, spin the bottle, make out parties. It's very important to do right now. <laughs> Uh, you know what I mean? You want to make sure you kiss each neighbor on the lips um, because that's the way to kind of to let them know that you support the neighborhood. Uh, that's bad advice. Don't do that. Uh, so definitely don't do that. Um, I guess, what do we do for fun, Fred? Uh, Jesus. I don't know. We do um, dishes, uh, laundry, uh, we walk the dog periodically, um, Fred more than me. Um, uh, I guess we do, you know, we do, we do like bits in the house, I guess. Uh, we did uh, George Carlin's comedy routine on this time period. Uh, Fred and I did that, in, you know, as a kind of dinner game. I said, we were like, kind of like, what would George Carlin's kind of comedy bit be in this time? Uh, so that was making us laugh. Can we see a little of that or no? Is that just, we have to imagine it. I think the material is too racy. Okay. And <laughs> we possibly- we'll, just, we'll leave it to our glory, imagination. His glorious legacy. But yeah, I think, I think there's, a, there's a fair measure of us doing things like that unintentionally that makes us laugh around here. Okay, we have one last, one last question, and that's uh, from Mickey. And is he? 
Mickey is just, you know. Is he like, just like? I'm going to tell you, Mickey Mouse is not a real person. I don't want to be the one to tell you, but I just think you keep calling him Mickey. And, oh, my you know. God. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Natasha, for taking the time. It's just so appreciated. And also, I do, I do have one last question, and that is, um, you made reference to it previously, but you must be reflecting on how Russian Doll has taken on a kind of new meaning in this moment. And I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Just like we're all kind of living in a kind of... Yeah, I mean, it's a very, you know, it's uh, certainly very, very strange times. Uh, and, you know, it's... I mean, I, I don't know what the, what it really has to do with, um, you know, th that question with the Russian doll of it all. But I mean, it's uh, it's certainly, uh, you know, interesting to, to see the ways in which, um, you know, the work that we make is kind of reinterpreted for different times, you know. Um, and that's uh, definitely like the idea of, um like a never-ending you know looping sort of exterminating angel no exit you know concept was sort of you know the crux of the show um so it's no surprise that it's sort of uh you know suddenly resonant um on a more you know human level obviously like the uh you know the big idea of that show is is sort of like that as long as we're sort of, um, you know, not allowing ourselves to be like fully cut off from humanity, that we can sort of like survive and endure anything. So, you know, I would say like, um, you know, a very dangerous game, you know, if you're, you know, uh, artistically wired or any which way wired is probably sort of the risk of isolate while in isolation, uh, if that makes sense. And, you know, in part, that's kind of, you know, at the, the core of what that show is about. So like this idea of, you know, almost like, you know, reaching out to uh, another human being, even when that feels like, oh, I just want to be sort of like left alone with my devices and my, you know, iPhone and my, my things. And like, you know, I don't want to be a bother to anybody. And I'll just kind of like wallow in my own, pit. like a little bit like the downside of, you know, not functioning is, you know, we forget the kind of like that sparky thing that like, I never want to go anywhere. I'm, I never want to do anything until I'm there. And then I'm usually like, oh, this is kind of sort of sparky and kind of different than I anticipated. You know, like I usually am like, I, I never want to get out of bed. I never want to leave the house. I don't want to go. I'm like, ah, traffic, I don't know, fucking trains and taxi, who needs it, you know? But then usually I get there and there's like a little thing that's kind of like funny or a small interaction. And usually it's like, I never want to get up, but you can also never put me to sleep. And kind of now we're missing that crucial sort of human connection part that reminds us that, you know, uh, it's a long way of saying, don't buy the lie of the mind. Like, I think there's a reason that like, you know, the, the, the greater punishment than prison is solitary confinement. And we find ourselves in a situation that naturally lends itself to that, especially if we're, um, you know, I know it doesn't seem this way and based on some of the other things I've, I've said about my fantasies for how to make things, but um, in my own way, I'm very much like um, an introvert in the sense that I just want to be like left alone in a room. Like, obviously that's why I kind of dropped out of society is I very much wanted to just be like left alone. And I was like, not for me. I'm going to stay in my corner with my books and my movies and my music and, you know, well, and that can be very, um, you know, it's important to remember that like other people kind of like help us to feel uh, connected and not to be like scared to, to sort of like reach out. And that's, you know, also there's probably, if it's not you, there's probably somebody that you know who kind of needs that reach out. And like just that little bit of humanity will like buy you another 48 hours. Um, so, uh, yes, you know, like sort of like staying uh, human through this. Uh, 
and not just, you know, shutting down and going into full nihilism, existentialism, depression. You know, these are become real sort of, you know, tricks of the trade and a real sort of like tools to home is like how to make, you know, one's mind a sort of a, a safe space um, when you have to spend so much time in it without uh, distraction. So. Very well said. And thank you so much, Natasha. So appreciated. Shout out to Laurel Collier. I'll see you at final reviews. Henry, thank you so much. Guys, it's so nice to meet you. I, I hope to see all the things that you make and stay in the fight. And, uh, you know, don't give up hope. Uh, life will be back. Uh, you know, life finds a way. We've all seen that. Uh, so, this was all right. fantastic. And good luck on the season two. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye.